founded on the rock. Now, in the psalm, David makes a declaration that every believer must and should understand to fully comprehend what the rock, Christ Jesus, means in your life, your personal life. He says this in Psalm 28, verse 1. To you I will cry, O Lord, my rock, do not be silent to me, lest if you are silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. You know what the pit is, don't you? Now, how many want to go to the pit? No volunteers? That's great. All right. Now, in this verse, David refers to the Lord as a rock. He said, O oh Lord, my rock. Okay? What does this mean to you as a believer? When we say that Jesus is the rock of ages, what does that mean? Now, in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4, Paul said, The Lord Jesus Christ is our rock. Amen. So what does it mean? So what we're going to discover tonight. Now, I want you to understand what the rock was at Kadesh and Horeb. In the wanderings of the children of Israel, you will not understand that sentence otherwise. All right? What does it mean? Jesus is our rock, and the Bible tells us that we are living stones. Do you realize you're a living stone? Okay. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. Now, he no longer resides in handmade buildings, does he? Like he did in the past with the Jewish. He now lives in you, your lively stones. Now, he's the rock, we're the stones, living stones. But unfortunately, when God, through the Holy Spirit, starts to chisel away some of the rough edges, have you had a few rough edges? Some of you have. Some of us complain and we resist a little. Now, God wants to chisel some of you enough, a little rough sometimes, to get all those fleshly edges off. You do realize you've had a few fleshly edges, okay? Now, the Holy Spirit desires to work with you to carve away everything that is unnecessary and unwanted in your life so you can be molded and conformed to his image. All right? The Bible says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 139, verse 14. I want you to say it with me. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, translated, that means you are special, you are unique. That's you. There's not another person like you. Praise God. Now I mean that in a good way. You are absolutely different. There is no one else like you. Now your wife might say, well, hmm, praise God. Amen. So when God created you, he made you a very special person. Christ is a solid rock. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 4, that the rock was Christ, all right? Paul says he, Jesus, is the cornerstone, precious and elect in Zion. Now, 1 Peter 2.6 says this, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he who believes on him will be by no means be put to shame. Now, in the times of the Bible, the cornerstone was selected, and the cornerstone determined the strength of the building. You understand? All right? Now, a cornerstone is, I've got five points to here, just so you get the point properly. Number one, a building, a stone at the corner of a wall, uniting two walls. Two, a building. A stone placed at the corner of a building during a ceremony to mark the start of construction. Three, a stone representing the nominal starting place of the construction of a monumental building, usually carved with a date. Four, an indispensable and fundamental basis. And finally, five, the foundation on which something is constructed or developed. 
Now, the cornerstone had to be without flaw, without blemish. See, a hairline crack in the cornerstone rendered the stone, I believe, absolutely, totally useless, right? Now, Jesus is, get this, the cornerstone of your life. Okay? You believe that? And the good news for you today is this, that there is no shadow of turning in him, and he is perfect. Amen. He's without flaw. You can build your life upon him. Now, knowing that he's not just a precious cornerstone, but also one that is, is without spot or blemish. The cornerstone also determines the potential, doesn't it? It was God's intention for his church to be a supernatural church. Do you believe that? Oh, it was. Listen, Jesus was born supernaturally. He lived supernaturally. He performed miracles supernaturally. He cast out demons supernaturally. He started his church supernaturally. He's coming back again supernaturally. It is his purpose that we be signs and wonders built upon the cornerstone. Understand? That's our foundation. A foundation of the supernatural. Let that then be the cornerstone of your life, so you'll never be ashamed or embarrassed. Neither of your Christian experience then be boring. It should be lively. All right? The cornerstone also determines the completion of the building. Now, not only was the cornerstone the first stone laid that would determine the size, the strength of the building, but the last stone to be laid in the temple at Jerusalem was also a cornerstone which determined its completion. The message is, without Christ, you and I are not complete. He is the cornerstone of life. Then, as he is, so should you be. He's enduring, so should you be. Now, many people are worrying about enduring to the end. Stop it. Fear is of the devil. It's not from God. Faith is of God. And no matter what comes in life, we should be faithful people. Could you imagine if you lived in the days of the Romans before Christianity became, you know, a change there? You think that you're tough we have? That's what we go through nothing compared to those people. All right? Many people today are worrying about enduring the end times here. We should be happy. We know where we're going, don't we? Okay. Well, if you're on Christ's solid rock, you will not have to worry. Jesus is the first and the last. He's the Alpha and the Omega. Now, in the Hebrew or Aramaic, he's the Aleph and the Tav. He was saying, I am the Word or the Logos. That's the written word that was in the beginning. Now, in the first line of Genesis, he was there with God, all right? He was in the beginning, and all things were created through him, all right? So he was here in the beginning, and when it's finally over, he will be here in the end. We've got God's word on that. Now, if you're in Christ, you will endure the powers of hell, cannot, will not, shall not conquer you. Amen? You just have to learn endurance. As he is stable, we should also be stable. Now, there are only two foundations. Do you know what they are? Rock and sand. Okay? They are the only two types of builders that Jesus gave. Wise and foolish builders. And if you've selected for your life the foolishness of sand your life will end in frustration and ruin. However, if you've built your life on Christ the solid rock, you will endure and you will prevail no matter what comes against you. You will be stable and your potential will know no limits and your completion will be absolute and perfect. He is the rock 
the Bible tells us, in a weary land. Now, what does that mean? Well, we're going to look at Exodus chapter 17, and let's discover some of the history of Israel so that you can fully understand. Exodus 17, 6. I will stand before you on the rock at Mount Sinai. Smite, strike the rock, and waters will come gushing out. Then the people will be able to drink. So Moses struck the rock as he was told, and water gushed out as the elders looked on. Now Israel is here in the wilderness, and it was a wilderness, right? Of Oreb. They are hot. They are thirsty. They would be desiring cool, clear, refreshing water. They knew the water could come from the sky if clouds came over and it rained, but they never saw much rain like that. But who would ever expect water to come from a rock? Have you ever seen water come from a rock? I haven't either. It was a totally unexpected source of blessing. Now Isaiah 53 verse 2 says, When we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Now the Jews, they said of him, we're speaking of Jesus now, in his earthly ministry, how can he be a savior? How can he be a messiah? He's nothing but a carpenter. Don't worry if you're a carpenter, Jesus was. Okay? But God the Father said, this is my rock. He is my son in whom I am well pleased. To the Jews, how, how could he conquer Rome? That's all they wanted to know. How could they get free from Rome? When Jesus gave one of his first messages, the Sermon on the Mount is called, the Jews flocked to hear his message at first. And he began with, the meek shall inherit the earth, the blessed are the meek, for they shall be comforted. His approach was not what the society of that time expected, but his approach was of the Father. He seemed a rock of barrenness to them, but the Father smote his side at Calvary, and out of it flowed a stream of blood and water. Blood that forgives all of us of our sin if we accept. Water to purify you by the washing of the word. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come unto me, all of you that labor and are heavily laden, I will give you what? Rest. We expect rest to stay in a hotel or something, or a nice bedroom. But who expects rest from a rock? Jesus said, I am the rock. If you rest upon me, you shall not be confounded. You will not be dismayed. You will not be conquered. I am the answer that will give hope and stability to your life. Notice the rock gave no water until it was smitten. Now, here in Exodus 17, Christ provided solutions only when he was smitten on the cross. Jesus Christ at Calvary conquered our sin. My sin, your sin. Okay? Jesus Christ at Calvary guarantees me eternal life in the right place. Correct? Come on. Jesus Christ at Calvary guarantees me healing if necessary. Jesus Christ at Calvary guarantees I'm adopted into the family of God. All of us are, right? Therefore, today I can say glory to God for the cross. Because I am part of the family of God. So are you. Now notice in this text of Exodus 17 verse 6. Behold, I will stand before you on the rock at Mount Sinai. Smite, strike the rock, and water will come gushing out. Then the people will be able to drink. Notice, the rock had to be smitten with the rod of the lawgiver, or else there would be no water. Moses was the lawgiver, smote the rock. The result was it brought refreshing and life to all those of Israel. God the Father smote his son Jesus, a rock of ages, didn't he? And restored my soul, your soul, redeemed me, you, 
from all the powers of sin and Satan. Did you know that? Oh, yes, he did. Rome did not kill Jesus. The Jews and their conspiracy did not kill Jesus. He died at the cross at the hands of his father. Did you know that? It pleased the father to bruise him so that our redemption would be complete. That is the reason Jesus cried at the cross in Matthew 27, 46, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It, not, it wasn't the hand of Pilate. It wasn't the conspiracy of Herod. It was not the crown of thorns that killed him. It wasn't the nails that killed him. It wasn't the whip that killed him. It was the hand of the Father who loved us with that everlasting love. When God the Father saw his Son, Christ the Rock, on the cross, he smote him, or allowed him to be, and out of his side flowed blood and water. The blood forgives all our sin. Isn't that great? Not a part of it, all of it. Have you, have you built up enough sin you've let it's gone? That it covers it? You don't even know half of what you did, do you? You did some just in ignorance. Now, when we speak of water, it does speak of refreshing, right? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you have everlasting life? Oh, yes, you do if you're a believer. So he smote the rock, and because the rock had been smitten, I now live through the authority of the cross. So do you. All right? Now, notice that the rock was smitten here publicly. Moses smote the rock before the elders at that time. Christ, the rock of our salvation, was also smitten publicly, wasn't he? When he hung on the tree at Calvary, there was a sign hung above his head that said, this is the king of the Jews. The soldiers mocked him. The high priest said, huh, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. Which was the only true statement that that priest ever made in a long time during his ministry. It is true. If Jesus Christ has saved himself, he could not have saved you and I. Did you know that? That's the truth. Praise God. Hmm. He could have come down from the cross, couldn't he? Some people don't understand. They think, you know, slowly his life was dripping away. I want to tell you something. The last breath he gave, it is finished. He shouted it. I've never seen a dead person shout like that. And I've seen some die. Do you understand? He finally gave up his life. He couldn't take it. He had to surrender it. All right? He could have come down from that cross. And the Bible tells me he could have called legions, 12 legions of angels, and decimated the entire earth if he'd have wanted to. You think about that. But because of his love for you and I, he chose to die at Calvary. He chose to die. Now, the religious Pharisees would have been pleased that that was the end of Jesus, wouldn't they? Could you imagine? But it was not the end. It was only the beginning. Now, back to Exodus 17, verse 6. God told Moses, I will stand before you upon the rock. Although it was a barren rock, a smitten rock, it was also, we'd have to say, an anointed rock with the Shekinah of God all over it. Now, if you ever visit Calvary, have any of you ever been there? A couple of you have. Yeah, well, right, you've been there, well, yeah. Amen. You can recognize that it is only a rock. But that rock was like a skull. That's why they call it Skull Mountain. It's getting worn now, you know. But the old pictures of it, it clearly looks like a skull. There's no doubt about it. And that's where Christ Jesus was crucified. The earth shook. Dead men arose from their graves. They walked into the streets of Jerusalem. Do you know? I, I think it says, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, about 500 came out of the tombs and they walked into Jerusalem. What would you think on the Gold Coast if some people you know were dead? 
and about 500 people on one day that were dead in their graves came out and walked down the surface of paradise. I think they'd clean that joint up real fast. Amen. Seriously. No wonder the Jews started to believe that early church. Amen. The earth shook. Dead men did arose from their graves, walking in the streets into Jerusalem. I mean, that, that's mind-blowing. Can you really imagine that? The sun was blackened at noon, though. And what happened then? Three o'clock, the veil of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. Now, the measurement of that temple is several feet high, the curtain, several inches thick. You'd almost need a crane to tear it in two. So supernaturally, maybe angels just went, the Spirit of God departed in a religious sense. Remember this, so don't get Jewish. They're following the wrong thing. Never, ever again would the Spirit of God reside in man-made temples. He now lives in me. And you, we're the temple of God. I think he wants a clean temple. Amen? He lives in your spirit. Thank God it's not the flesh, it's your spirit. You're a spirit, soul, and body. Now, there's no doubt then. This was showing that God did it from the top to the bottom, that temple curtain. There's no doubt God proved he was at Calvary. He left no doubt by signs and wonders that he did. Now, the spiritual changes that were about to be were enormous. The earth would never, ever be the same again. That's true. The priesthood would never be the same again. It was finished at that time. Listen. You never need another priest. Did you hear me? You do not need to submit to a priest anymore. Now don't get this wrong, keep listening. Or any other type, Jewish or other, to intercede before God the Father for you. That's because the temple curtain was split in half. And because of the blood, you and I can now enter the Holy of Holies with all boldness. We can intercede for ourselves now. You should be doing that. You are now a king and a priest unto your God. You are a royal priesthood. Do you understand? Let that penetrate your mind, your soul, and down into your spirit. It's very important. Amen? 1 Peter 2.29 tells you, you are that royal priesthood. All because the rock Christ Jesus was smitten. Now let me assure you, it was not the end when they placed him in the tomb. It was just the beginning. On resurrection morning, they found the stone pulled across from the opening of the tomb. All right? Now, the stone was not removed to let him out, but to let us in, to see he was not dead, but to witness that he had risen forevermore. He came forth, the cornerstone, precious and elect. He came forth, the rock of our salvation, and his banner over us, his love. Correct? He came forth as the foundation of the church. Religion likes to show him as a little baby. He's not a little baby. Hallelujah. He grew to manhood and paid the price. See? He came forth as the foundation of the church. The church is to be a glorious church. It's a victorious church. It's an enduring church. It's a stable church. Why? because he built it upon a solid rock. Hmm. Will it last? Yes, it will. Why? Because it's not built upon flesh and blood, is it? It's built on the rock Christ Jesus. And because of that, I can prophesy to you 
The gates of hell shall not, will not overcome it, but it shall endure to the very end, and Christ will win. You will see that in your lifetime very, very soon. We're in those days. I don't care about, they talk about persecution. I do not care about the slander or anything else. It will endure because Jesus is a solid rock. Okay, back to the phrase in Psalm 28, 1. It says, the Lord is my rock. Now, in this situation, in the book of Exodus, the stream from the rock of Horeb did not trickle out to satisfy a handful. It satisfied everyone. Now, there's at least two million. Imagine two million people, animals and things, all needing water. Just think of that miracle flowing out of a rock. Mm. Now, let's talk of another stream. The stream that flowed from Calvary did not just satisfy a few in Jerusalem. Metaphorically, it is a stream of blood if you look at it spiritually, that rolled down the hill of Calvary into Jerusalem itself, all of Israel, into Egypt, the whole Middle East, across the African continent, into the Mediterranean nations, into Europe, then to all the other nations, the down under mob. Now, wherever the gospel of Jesus has been preached, that precious blood is still greater than all of our sin. His grace is sufficient. That blood purges us, it cleanses us from all sin, and makes us into a new creature in Christ Jesus. The Lord is our rock. Amen? Look, the Lord is your rock. Realize it, believe it. The Lord is our rock. That's our foundation. You cannot escape the goodness and the grace of God. Are you in the wilderness tonight, in the midst of despair? Look to the rock. The cross spelt death for Jesus, but the rock Christ Jesus came alive, and it can lead you to life eternal. And if you're a true believer, you know that's where you're going. Amen? Now, I want to look at Numbers, the 20th chapter, verse 8. Now, Moses wrote 13 verses that David highlights in one verse. He said, the Lord is my rock. So let's read verse 8 onwards. Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together, speak to the rock. Then the verse continues. Before their eyes, and it will yield its water, thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand. He struck the rock twice with his rod. Water came out abundantly, and the congregation, the animals, drank. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. Now, this is the second expression of the rock, all right? At Oreb, the rock gushed forth, and now we come to Kedesh, a place where they speak to the rock. Kedesh signifies holiness. You may be thinking, why holiness? Well, the Bible says, without holiness, you shall never see God. So, how Bible is a holy Bible? How God is a holy father? Our Savior is the holy child Jesus. We're going to a holy city, aren't we? In Revelation, the angels sing a song, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. Now notice this rock produced water, not by smiting it, but speaking to it. What a miracle. Two million people, their tongues are hanging out, animals. Moses just speaks to it, and water flows out. There were two million people. Isn't that amazing? Now, how do you bless someone? You bless them by speaking to them. 
How does the Father bless the Son? He blesses him by speaking to him, correct? Now in number 16, God very clearly gave to Israel how the blessings would be transferred. He made it very clear they would transfer it by speaking it from father to son. When you're in spiritual authority, you can speak a blessing. You become a rock of life. And what you begin to speak under the anointing of the Holy Spirit becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy in the life of that child you're speaking to. By the way, it's ladies too. God's not differing there. He just says, you know. I think that's the way the Jewish people wrote it. All right. Preaching is speaking the word of God. It's not powerful because of the speaker. It's powerful because of the message and anointing. God's word is anointed. It's life and spirit. I bet you've had to sit, oh, well, I remember the schoolroom just sometime. Boring. Yeah, something just boring. You know, not lively, was it? Yeah, but the word is alive. It's not boring. Spoken with authority and understanding. The church and the preacher should be a stream of living water, shouldn't they? Beginning life wherever it goes. Speaking words that heal. Speaking words that bring peace. Speaking words that can bring deliverance where necessary. Speaking words that bring hope where necessary. But some of God's people are wells without water. Trees without fruit, clouds without rain. If so, you have nothing in your soul, mind, but religious routine. A ritual. But when you plug into Christ the solid rock, you begin to feel his life and vitality. Correct? Out of your innermost being shall flow streams of living water. That's what the word says. And everyone that gets around you should begin to live because in you is the living, breathing form of the Son of God. Or let's say it should be. The church is the stream in the desert. How do you give life? You speak life. I want you to hear this. At Kadesh, Moses did not obey the Lord. Instead of speaking to the rock, he smote it twice. The rock at Horeb symbolizes Jesus Christ who was smitten once at Calvary, but the rock at Kadesh is the church. It is smitten twice, and that symbolizes persecution. Have you noticed his persecution is coming to the church? Are somebody beginning to understand this? Hmm. It's not just coming, it's already arrived. Many laws restrict the church. They're trying to bring mandates, all kinds of things on the church, apart from other things, right? So what is the solution? Keep speaking life, keep a blessing. Overcome evil, how? With good, you can. The Bible has a message for persecutors. If they persecute the church, those who preach the gospel or those who are standing up for righteousness, guess what they're doing? They're taking on God themselves. If God is for you, who could be against you? Do you believe that? Do believe it. The pressure may build a bit before he returns. Because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I believe that. Matthew 16, 13 to 19. When Jesus came into the region of Caesar Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Oh, some John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? My answer would be that he is my Redeemer, my Lord and Savior. He's a King of Kings. He's the Lord of the universe, is he not? He has got all power, all authority in heaven, on the earth, and guess what? Under the earth. 
All right? Through him, we become sons of God. Amen? And now I can represent him on this earth. So can you. Why? Because you have been given delegated power of attorney in the name of Jesus. Every one of you. Oh, I don't know. Well, start looking at it. You have. That means, understand what that means, I can do the same works that Jesus did. What about you? You should too. You can heal the sick. You can cast out demons. I get a kick out of that. Huh? You can be a ministry of reconciliation. Now in the Bible, how did Simon Peter answer that question? Simon Peter answered and he said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but by my Father who is in heaven, by the Spirit of God only. That's what it meant. And I also say to you, you are Peter, on this rock, on that revelation that you've just spoken, not on Peter himself, revelation of the Spirit. I will build my church, and the gates of hate shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, doesn't a key give you entrance to something? Hmm. What was once locked, once was locked up from you is now open. That's good to know, isn't it? Do you believe that? See, you've got to grasp that revelation. He's given you the keys. Every child of God, every son of God, it's not male or female, it's sons of God. We're all sons of God, all right? Male or female, it doesn't matter. That's what you are. Now, we understand in the natural what you are, okay? It's one of the most vital truths you can receive. Now, we should become determined. I'm determined to build my life upon the rock. The revelation of what I should become and do in this life while I still have breath. Through the knowledge and revelation of God's word. Now, why would we bother to do that? Because when we get there, you are going to give an account to Jesus himself. He's not going to punish you. He just revealed to you, you could have had so much more. Your authority, your position for eternity could be really great. Do you know what? If every one of you gave up everything just every day, I'm going to follow Jesus, I'm going to do everything I can. I'm not saying not to stop working, but, you know, in your life, looking for opportunities to present Jesus Christ. Pray for the sick, raise the dead, do all those things. That's what God wants you to do, whether you believe it or not. It's the truth. And when you stand before him, you'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. He gives crowns to you. It's positions of authority for eternity. We're going to rule and reign with him. Do you believe that? You should, because you are. What you do now puts you in a position, an office for eternity, to rule and reign with Christ. We think about that. We don't think about those things enough. We're more interested in this world. How do we survive? How do we do that? But come on. How do we get to that position? By the knowledge and revelation of God's word, nothing else, then applying it in your life and making yourself available. Okay? God's desire is that you too will have those desires to do that. The rock is the revelation, the foundation, the cornerstone for your life. It's up to you and I to build our lives on it. Amen. Amen. Do you understand? Come on, give it your best chance if you can. Look, it doesn't matter how late you start, just do something. I'm sure when we meet it there, you say, oh, thank God, Steve, I've, I've start, I did start to do something. I've got a great mansion now. And, you know, I had a talk with Jesus, and he said to me, this is what you're going to do. You're going to serve me now with a position of authority. <laughs> Praise God. All right, well, it's the truth. Amen. God bless you.